Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Mankind Pharma, I, Dr. Ashtosh Gautam, welcome you all to this live webinar on dealing with unpredictable the COVID crossroads. Amid growing concerns over the rising number of cases of the Omicron variant of COVID-19 across the globe, experts fear a third wave of pandemic in coming months in India. The nightmare of deadly second wave in summer months of this year is still haunting us. Government of India has taken, undertaken an exhaustive vaccination drive to vaccinate entire eligible population of India with four, 140 crore jabs given till date. Omicron transmission rate, ability to bypass immunization are concerns looming over each one of us. To guide us more on the prevailing situation of COVID pandemic, we have the renowned panel of experts today. But before we move on to the scientific agenda for today, I request my colleague from marketing, Ms. Vibha Singh, to take you through the brief corporate overview of Mankind Farm. Thank you, Dr. Ashutosh. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Vibha Singh, and I represent marketing team of Mankind Pharma. With significant achievements of nearly two and a half decades of great work, which consistently deserves compliment, is the leadership and ability to stay abreast in this changing period of last 25 years. Mankind Pharma began its journey in 1995, founded by the first generation entrepreneur, our honorable chairman, Mr. R. C. Juneja, sir, with a vision of becoming the most admired pharma company in India. Keeping that vision in mind, today we are amongst the top five fastest growing pharmaceutical company, with number one ranked in terms of prescription and fourth in terms of revenue, which is approximately 1 billion USD. Over the years, we have well represented ourselves in almost all major therapeutic segment with leadership position in many of them. We are among the top five in anti-infectives, gynecology, cardiology, diabetes, and many more. We have also been working on innovations in formulation and dosage form for drug delivery. One of the main factor behind our success of being fastest growing pharma company is also an operational excellence and strong supply chain that enables us to reach the highest coverage of 600,000 pharmacies and 400,000 healthcare providers with largest field force of 13,500. Mankind's R&D center is located in Manasa, Delhi NCR, having a dedicated team of over 400 scientists involved in complex and innovative research. Some of our clinical research and biopharmaceutical capabilities include new drug discovery and research, advanced pharmacokinetic mod modeling, biostatistics formulation and development, and clinical research. Mankind's new drug discovery and research pipeline include targets for NASH, arthritis, and diabetes. We are happy to share that recently our novel GPR119 agonist for diabetes has shown better glycemic control over cetagliptin in animal trial, and the molecule has now entered into phase one trial. On the front of COVID-19, Mankind Research Team is collaborating with Daivung Pharmaceutical from Korea to repurpose injectable niclosamide against COVID-19. After the onset of second wave, Mankind has pledged 100 crore contribution for the frontline warriors, including doctors, paramedical staff, chemists, policemen, and their families. Mankind has distributed 5,000 oxygen cylinders 5,000 concentrators with an approx value of 40 crore for COVID-19 patients. Mankind has also started 70 bedded COVID-19 hospital in Gurugram to serve patients suffering from the disease. Dear doctors, it is with your patronage that Mankind has reached so far. Our endeavor to partner with healthcare providers like you will help us to achieve the objective and mission of improved healthcare in India and abroad. Thank you. Let me have the honor and a privilege to introduce our moderator for the session, Dr. Yatin Mehta. Dr. Yatin Mehta is the chairman of the Institute of Critical Care and Anesthesiology, Medanta Medicity Hospital, Gurgaon. Life member of Indian Society for Anesthesiologists, life member of Indian Association for Cardiovascular Thera uh, Thoracic Anesthesiologists, life member of Indian uh, Association for Cardiovascular Thoracic Surgery, life member of Indian Society for Critical Care Medicine. We welcome you, sir. And with this, I hand over the session uh, to Dr. Yatin Mehta to introduce other uh, speakers for the this evening. Over to you, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you, my organizer. We have we have three speakers today. Uh, last speaker would be Dr. Uh, Randeep Guleria. Well, he's the most uh, well-known face of uh, COVID fight in um, in India. 
is a director of the Institute of Medical Sciences, a professor and head of pulmonary and critical care medicine, and one of the most renowned um, uh, academician and highly respected COVID warriors. He was honored with Padma Shri in 2015. So he's going to talk on lessons learned and prospects for the future. The other speaker is uh, the first speaker is Dr. Subramaniam Swaminathan, again, a very well known um, infectious disease uh, physician. Yeah, and he's a head of infectious disease uh, in global group of hospitals. Uh, he's a member of CIDS and uh, IDSA and HIV MA um, Association of Physicians of India, Indian Medical Association. He has been actually uh, the executive members and uh, um, presidents of the, these societies. And so have I been, by the way. Member being a society member is not sufficient for <laughs> anyway. So he's going to talk about Omicron, which is the latest. The latest uh, addition to the uh, virus fight which we have. And next, uh, the second speaker is Dr. Pradeep Rangappa. He's a, a, a physician intensivist from uh, Bangalore uh, in the Columbia Asia Hospital. He's a vice president of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, also ex-accreditation secretary uh, for the uh, Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, and uh, he is very academically and critically very active. He's one of the COVID uh, prime forces um, in uh, uh, Karnataka. So uh, I will begin with uh, Dr. Subramanian Swaminathan, uh, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, very kind of you to introduce me. And uh, nice of everybody to invite me for this uh, evening's program. So let me start by sharing my slides. Right, so I'm going to be talking about Omicron. Um, when the WHO started uh, naming alphabets, uh, using the Greek alphabet for naming all these uh, variants, I was very concerned that uh, they were probably taking the wrong alphabet because they'll run out of alphabets fairly quickly. Uh, and I still maintain that this is probably the wrong choice. They should have taken an alphabet like the Tamil alphabet, which has far more options in terms of alphabets. So what do we know about Omicron? Well, it's a new SARS-CoV-2 uh, variant that has been reported from South Africa. South Africa takes major exception to that, that they're being penalized for being very good and diligent in terms of reporting. But having said that, let's just say it was reported from the southern part of Africa, initially called B11529 and now rechristened as Omicron. And uh, I don't want to talk about why it's called Omicron, let's just accept it. Interestingly, it has, there is a paradigm shift in the number of mutations. Usually when you have mutations occurring in a new variant, it's like five, eight, things like that. This one has an insane number of mutations all occurring suddenly. And uh, the most uh, concerning of it is that there are 30 mutations in the viral spike protein alone, which makes it a very different beast. And therefore, there's this concern that there could be immune escape and our uh, immunity, either natural or vaccine derived, could be a concern. So obviously, uh, our concern is because with every major variant of concern that's come up, whether it's the alpha, beta, or the delta, there have been significant waves across the world. So the question is, will this also lead to a wave? The answer is actually pretty obvious right now. There is a wave. And uh, if, there, the, if the wave has not started, it will start very, very soon. So WHO, um, I mean, I'm not somebody who I take too seriously, has decided to call Omicron a very high risk globally. Well, that part I agree. Preliminary evidence say that it may be more transmissible. Well, it's kind of smacking you in the face by the way it is going up in speed. And yes, the problem is that there are so many variants, uh, so many changes in the spike protein that our immune system may not may have significant difficulty even with medications. And obviously, vaccines may not work just as well. We all know that. And the monoclonal antibodies may end up struggling against this. So that all of this remain a significant concern. So. Uh, this is actually a, 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 a pictorial representation of how far Omicron is with regards to Delta. As you can see, in the spike protein alone, there are so many different differences that it kind of leaves Delta in the dust. To me, it is almost like Alpha, Beta and Delta got together and had a very horrible baby and they started to pull in some more uh, different mutations and out came Omicron. It's almost like, you know, somebody did something horrible as a science um, uh, horror movie and out came Omicron. But the question is, is it really bad? Is it really, really that bad? Well, that's what remains to be seen. So obviously there are some major, major concerns. 
So the first question is, is it going to be bad? We all know that this is a variant of concern. We all know that it's leading to rise in numbers very, very quickly. What do I mean by rise in numbers? In the United States, uh, Omicron went from just about 1% of all sequenced uh, uh, variants to 73% in two weeks time. Imagine going from 1% to 70%, 73% in two weeks. That is incredible speed. So obviously, is it going to be serious? Are we get, going to get overwhelmed? We already had one round of meeting. We can't take another one. Can vaccine protection be overwhelmed by this? Big question. What is the transmissibility and how bad will transmissibility be? Will there be immune escape? People who are already so-called immune, will they still remain immune or whether that will be impacted? What about... Uh, efficacy for mild infection. See, when we talk about vaccines, to me, vaccines are not a way to prevent infection. It's definitely a great way to prevent severe disease and death. Will that still hold good? Will that still be, will, will there be protection against mild infections? Or is there going to be a major problem in all of these things? So first question is, is there a higher transmissibility? We do seem to have data now that it is definitely more transmissible than the previous variants. And there is increased risk of reinfection. See, that is what is scary. Uh, UK HSA yesterday, they submitted, a, uh, they put out their data and they've estimated that Delta virus occurs as a reinfection in a person who's had previous COVID only 8% of the time. On the other hand, Omicron, they are estimating it very conservatively at around 40%, meaning 40% of the Omicron infection, uh, patients infected have already had COVID in the past. So basically having COVID in the past, whether it's Delta or the Wuhan or whatever it is, really doesn't give you any protection against Omicron. And that is a little bit of a concern. So obviously it has significant transmission advantage, immune escape, probably both. And definitely it looks like there may be some fitness advantage over the predominant Delta, so much so that it is, it's squeezing Delta. There's a mathematical modeling out which said by December 31st, it will kill Delta everywhere. So what's happening in Ground Zero, which is in South Africa, uh, Ridwan Suleiman, who's the, one of the senior guys over there in the uh, infection control guy, infection disease guys, actually he's put out these uh, uh, tweets on uh, these tweets over the last month or so. And as you can see, the waves are the first wave is the Wuhan virus. They didn't have alpha; they had a beta wave. Then they had the delta wave, and now they have the Omicron wave. What stands out is the speed at which the Omicron wave has taken off, and it's already on the way down. And it's interesting to note here. Look at the timeline. It's only by day 30 that the numbers start rising. And by day 50, they're already on the way down. On, on the other hand, all the other uh, waves have all had the similar playbook. They all start, by, if they start by day 30, they slowly amble along. And by another two months time, they peak, uh, peak and then they slowly come down. This one is literally like Kutub Minar, up the up, up si daisy, down si daisy. That's really creepy because such a sharp wave can really overwhelm any health system. So if you look at the transmission time in Omicron at Gauteng province, numbers were rising very, very fast. See, this is a very old uh, slide. <laughs> this is the one which has been formally peer reviewed and published. I'll show you newer data. This is from Lancet of December 2011. But this data is probably from uh, here, this part of it. We now have this much more data. Obviously, this is not peer reviewed. You can see how fast it's going up and coming down. So obviously, it's much faster than the first, second or third waves. <clears throat> for them, it's a fourth wave. We didn't have a delta. And the doubling time is much, much faster. Uh, in London, they said the doubling time was about one and a half days. Across England, uh, they estimated the doubling time to be somewhere between one and a half to three, two days, which is incredible, which is just the sheer speed of it is mind boggling. So the reason why we worry about it is because of the transmissibility. So this again came out yesterday, December 23rd data. They looked at uh, Omicron and they looked at uh, Delta, as we can see, the risk of transmission, both uh, household and non-household, is much higher than even Delta. Uh, so household contacts are nearly one and a half times more likely to get transmitted, and non-household uh, uh, contacts are two and a half times more likely to, you know, more transmission. So this is insanely fast. We thought Delta was fast. This one is on steroids. So obviously, we know there is more transmission. But there's been concern about the severity. So everybody was saying there's no severity. It's like a common cold. Well, since people are dying, we can very clearly uh, conclude that this is not a common cold. Nobody dies a common cold. So uh, WHO said that uh, the clinical profile of patients uh, <clears throat> can change and the impact of Omicron can change. See, the point is that the more vaccinated and the less vulnerable a population, you would think it is less of a problem. It's not that simple. So even if it has severe disease, then there can be, you could still have disastrous consequences. 
The earlier data that came out actually suggested that uh, Omicron was spreading at about five times the speed of Delta, and the severity was one fifth the severity of Delta. So you kind of put it together, it kind of cancels itself out, and that basically means a heck of a lot of numbers. So at the look of it, the numbers could be a problem. So what we are dealing with is a large number, exponential rise in numbers, and even a small percentage of that can be seriously, seriously a big problem to healthcare. And therefore, let's understand that mild infections are going to be humongous. Number of people who have fever is going to be humongous. Our concern is about whether the severe patients and the critical patients can be managed in the healthcare system. And we are hoping that we don't get over. So this is from uh, Bern Murdoch, who's the, uh, the numbers guy at uh, Financial Times. And as you can see, he has shown what's happening in Gauteng. The, what I showed you was South Africa. The Gauteng, the leftmost one is the cases. As you can see, the numbers have started coming down. Test positivity, which is what usually you see, uh, that's a very good surrogate for this. It started coming down. Hospital admissions went up, but did not go up as high as Delta. If you look at Delta as 100%, it's probably not even half of that, maybe just about half. The deaths have just started rising, and the excess deaths have also started rising now. Obviously, these things will peak a little later, but obviously, these numbers seem very, uh, what shall I say, uh, reassuring, but it's still too early for us to conclude that this is okay, because only time will tell us. What about diagnostics? RT-PCR is still the most accepted. So we have RT-PCR, which can uh, detect various parts of the virus, like the <coughs> spike, the envelope, nucleocapsid, RDRP, and things like that. Because the S-gene is heavily mutated, it can lead to S-gene drop-off. So S-G-T-F, or S-gene target failure. We are now hearing uh, reports of uh, Omicron where there is no S-gene target failure. So it's just getting more and more muddy. So obviously, uh, it was being seen in the alpha variant, but once the alpha variant went away, the SGN target failure was no longer an issue. Now it's coming back with Omicron. But obviously, only gene sequencing can tell us very sure that uh, this is Omicron. Also note that US FDA has recently issued an advisory that certain RT-PCR kits are not picking it up because they have single uh, point of uh, testing, which is the nucleocapsid, and there is a nine nucleotide uh, deletion because of which the particular uh, uh, target is missing. So obviously, RT-PCR kits uh, are also something which you should be using, used, uh, interpreted carefully. The good news is the RT-PCR kits which are available in India do not seem to have a problem. They will identify it as COVID. They cannot identify it as Omicron. You have to do gene sequencing. So now that uh, Omega, WHO has declared uh, Omicron as a variant of concern, con concern after its due assessment, so obviously it is based on the fact that there is mutations, there is increased transmissibility, uh, it is going to change the way the epidemiology is, and there is immune evasion. So all of these things are being uh, assessed. However, obviously they are waiting for more data to make a definitive decision. And uh, I'm sure they will be very good at flogging a dead horse. So what can we do to slow down transmissibility? See, a lot of it, a lot of time and energy has been spent on uh, hand hygiene. Hand hygiene remains a good thing, for a lot of different reasons. But this is an airborne pathogen, and therefore the value of hand hygiene is actually reducing. It's not to say that hand hygiene is not important. It's important, but air is far more important. So the six feet and social distancing and all that really is not very protective if you're indoors. Indoor air problems are the major concern. When you're outdoors, six feet or two meters is awesome, especially if both of you uh, are masked. On the other hand, when you're indoors, even this is not adequate, and transmission is especially intense, especially when you have recirculated air without external air. Since most of us live in climate-controlled environments where we have a centralized AC or something like that, it's the tinderbox for COVID transmission. So more and more countries are now looking at their air handling patterns in uh, public areas in an attempt to try and see how they can uh, retard the transmission of uh, the Omicron variant. What about uh, vaccines and uh, where are we with that? So obviously, we know that some vaccine, uh, not all vaccines seem to work very well. The good news is uh, Discovery South Africa, their number one insurer, seem to have suggested that the majority of severe illness seems to have occurred in unvaccinated or under-vaccinated uh, population. Problem is, the vaccines available in South Africa and vaccines available against in India are not the same. So, bit of a problem. So, uh, we need to understand that vaccines are not uh, just the antibody titer. 
uh, I'm, I don't bother about antibody titers because it doesn't uh, look at the major part of the immunity, which is a T-cell mediated immunity and other forms of immunity. So I don't really care about that. Obviously, there is going to be some benefit with that. So therefore, uh, getting the primary series of vaccination is absolutely critical. Uh, the question of booster vaccine remains a vexing problem. I think uh, there, uh, my personal opinion, there is a role for that. But having said that, uh, I don't think anybody can show clear data to say that it will make a difference. Data from Israel about revaccination is pretty uh, compelling. That's the reason why most countries have started revaccination, the third dose. And so much so that since day before yesterday, Israel has started doing fourth dose of vaccine for all its people at high risk. So obviously, the mRNA vaccine, they have shown that the protection against the infection and severe disease starts coming down. And it pains significantly. 80% is probably an overestimation. It's probably more closer to 70% efficacy against severe disease. So that's the problem. So point is vaccines do wane over time. This happen, This is true for both the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and boosting seems to give some amount of benefit. So will boosting help? Obviously, uh, the primary series is what is most important. And so more and more countries are pushing the vaccine very, very aggressively. The countries which have very good levels of vaccination are now provided, trying to get the new uh, third dose in so that they have better options. And obviously, uh, in vitro suggest, uh, studies seem to suggest that those who have two doses of the vaccine and the infection are almost as good as three doses of the infection. And therefore, natural immunity does add some teeth to the vaccine immunity. So uh, it still means that the primary series of vaccination has to be completed. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I think India may be spared the blushes because of the severity of the Delta wave and with adequate levels of double vaccination, we may not have such a bad uh, beating in terms of severe disease, but that remains to be seen. Again, UK HSA yesterday's assessment, they've given the assessment for what they think. In terms of growth advantage, they put it in the red zone, fairly obvious. It's growing really, really fast and they, uh, it's a no-brainer. Transmissibility, they put it in the amber category because they want more information, but they feel that there is more transmissibility, but may not be as bad as they initially felt. Immune evasion in terms of infection after natural and uh, vaccine-derived immunity in the red category because we know that it is very smart and it doesn't care, really care much about your uh, immune system's uh, priming with vaccines and infections. It can still get you. But the infection severity, I'm a little disappointed they've given it as green. But again, it's, impor it's important to note that the confidence level in that is low, which basically means that still needs reassessment. All the other ones are... The red ones are in high and the non-red ones are low, which basically means those other ones are more likely to change. And I suspect that the infection severity, they may reassess and decide uh, to at least push it up to the amber level. So the question is, will there be a third wave? Well, there is a third wave in uh, South Africa. There is a third wave everywhere. So will there be a third wave in India? <laughs> I think that's not a very uh, difficult question to answer. Uh, it's already in India. Will it spread to India? No, it is already in India. We don't have to worry about spread. The scale, obviously, is difficult to predict. I think numbers will be high. The severity is what is most unclear. Obviously, the fast pace of vaccination and the high exposure to Delta would be something which is very, very important. But again, the last word is never said, and I think it's still going to be very difficult to take a call on this. And this is another phenomenon which I want to warn everybody about. This is what is happening in London. These are, The blue line is patients admitted for COVID. And the orange line here is patients admitted with COVID. That is, these are patients who came to hospital with COVID-related symptoms and they are admitted as COVID. These are patients who come to hospital for any number of things, whether it's labor and delivery or whether it's for a fracture or whether it's for elective surgery. And then they found out they were COVID positive. And if these are Omicron and they get into the hospital, you're going to have havoc in the hospital in terms of infections among other patients and also among the staff. The problem is keeping a hospital safe now is going to be extremely difficult. Also to note that if you look at what is happening in London, NHS has reported a more than two-fold jump in the number of healthcare workers who have been called sick because of COVID or uh, quarantine requirements in the last four days. Last four days. It's gone up from 1,500 to 4,000. So obviously it is uh, impacting a lot of these things and therefore it is uh, it is not just the wave we can see, there's also other hidden parts of the wave which we need to see. So how is the government of India uh, deploy, reacting to this? They're developing and deploying diagnostics. I'm just a little disappointed that there is no 
urgency in deploying rapid diagnostic kits, which are going to be absolutely critical. I can't wait for a PCR to come back. If I have a pregnant woman who comes to the ER or a heart attack, heart attack patient comes into the ER, I would like to have an RDT right there as a point of care testing to find out whether I can send a patient to wherever I need to, because I don't want to put a patient in the COVID side and make him COVID. At the same time, I don't want to put him on the negative side and get everybody else COVID. Both of those are uh, you know, just deplorable. We need to carry out more genomic surveillance. The good news is we probably need to do it only for two weeks. At the end of it, everything will be Omicron. Therapeutic development is going to be long-term. I don't think it's going to be easy. The good news is, except for the specific antivirals, all the other uh, COVID-specific uh, options will continue to work. Obviously, we're getting more and more setbacks. For example, the monoclonal antibody data seems to suggest that they won't work for uh, Omicron. And now uh, the new uh, submission from uh, Merck on Molnupiravir has suggested that the efficacy of the drug is not 50%, it's probably closer to 30%. So obviously, the bad news just keeps rolling in. And obviously, we need to generate a lot more data to understand how this virus is behaving. Problem is, we don't have enough time to look at the model from other countries to be ready because it's here now. So in summary, what I would say is Omicron is a new variant of concern, which is still being studied. And unfortunately, the time for study is almost over because the time for action is here. The breakthrough infections is in, uh, happens both in those who are vaccinated and those who are previously infected, and that's a concern. Because earlier we used to talk about you know double vaccination and showing a green tick in your Arogya Setu. Now the question is, how, how useful is that? Because these people are just as infected and just as transmissible. And therefore, it's not possible to rely on vaccination alone to keep you safe. And that's why the mask is absolutely critical. The severity of, uh, of our infection in those who are vaccinated and those who are past infection seems a little better. Obviously, vaccination is far more protective. Previous infection does give you some protection, but not as, as great as uh, full vaccination. The speed of transmission still remains a major concern. And this could contrib contribute to very significant numbers because it's a question of scale. So I think that's going to be the curveball here. And ultimately, it's all going to be numbers, numbers, numbers. And it's a question of how well we're going to be able to manage the numbers. Thank you, and I'll stop now. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. Excellent beginning of the evening, uh, as usual. So I will re request now, Doctor, the question answer we'll have is during the panel discussion. I think that's better, because all the talks are related to each other. So uh, Dr. Rangappa, can you please start your presentation? Oh, good evening, everyone. So thanks, Dr. Ethin, sir. Uh, and thanks for uh, and kind of having me here. So in the next 15 minutes, I'll take you through just a brief overview. So what are the therapeutic options that uh, that has possibly changed in second wave? And uh, there has been so many studies uh, with regard to the various drugs that has been used. So where have we reached from there? So if you look at this, I'm sure many of the viewers would be very familiar with this. The whole game changer in COVID is to see how we can intervene during this viral replication phase and prevent hospital admissions. Really, uh, as an intensivist, we wouldn't want too many patients coming to ICU and scouting for ICU beds. And uh, if we can really curtail patients coming to ICU and we halt it by some intervention and we prevent viral replication, prevent patients going to inflammatory phase, I think we have won this game. So that is where our whole challenges has been. Because once they come into this inflammatory phase, needing oxygen, then you have all sorts of drugs and they come to hospital and they burden our health system. So what has been the journey so far? So there have been a lot of molecules that has come. So basically, when you look at COVID, there are four pillars of management for a clinician like me. So the first thing is the antiviral. So I'm sure every listener here would know all these molecules we have tried started from hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, retinovir, favipiravir. But all these have not stood the test of time. And uh, the evidence really faded over course of time after the first and second wave. And uh, remdesivir, although initially the enthusiasm was very huge, after the solidarity trial that came from WHO, even WHO removed remdesivir from its recommendation until two days back, we again saw a resurgence of this molecule with a study that came out in NEJM. And this molnupiravir, these are the newer uh, antivirals, which are a little similar to piravirs, basically. And there is a new one which just came in uh, two days back, which got FDA approval, which is nirmatrelvir with ritonavir, uh, which is called Paxlovid. Uh, so this is one arm. So our game changer is to see whether uh, these molecules can really prevent viral replication and prevent patients progressing to inflammatory phase needing ICU admission. The second important uh, pillar of our management is when they come to hospital, then there was a whole debate about steroid, high dose versus low dose. And uh, now that debate is really over. So we have subscribed that low dose is good enough, 6MG dexamethasone. So we will talk about it. 
and the steroid inhaler there was a stoic trial uh, there was only one study basically saying okay inhaler helps so we are not sure so there is no logical conclusion and then we we got all these maps basically the il6 receptor antagonist tocilizumab has stood the test of time the other maps really did not see much evolution after that but jack inhibitors which was a real late entry into the whole covid armamentarium stood the test of time and it still seems to have some merit in its usage bartonitinib and tofacitinib colchicine came and went came and went but there's no st real strong evidence to say we could subscribe to it. so this is the second pillar which we subscribe to the anti inflammatory and uh, the third pillar is anticoagulation so all of us have realized that covid is a very pro coagulant lot of microthrombi formation happens so there was a whole reproring debate about whether they should be on prophylactic therapeutic and in fact uh, we've had debates on this and uh, now there were two good trials that came in in ejm in fact they showed therapeutic anticoagulation in sick covid actually did more harm and and on the contrary they said therapeutic anticoagulation in mild to moderate which again came in nejm uh, said had a better outcome so we really do not have huge conclusions but if we, right now we can conclude that prophylactic is here to stay uh, to prevent all the thrombi formation aspirin came thrombolysis in anecdotal report and vasodilators like riosigot and avipedil is a very interesting molecule for our intensivists which i'll talk very briefly about and the fourth dimension of our or the fourth pillar of our care is the antibody cocktail so this is uh, something which uh, uh, sort of entered into the armamentarium bit late kesarivimab and imdevimab so it did hold promise at least if you have to subscribe to the evidence that is available the studies that came very 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 comprehensive study that came on kesarivimab and then interferon lambda there was a canadian study in fact it, that also showed good promise but there has been no progression on these uh, interferons so i think the antibody cocktail still possibly will have a role to play and this plasma there was a huge uh, furor about this uh, plasma which is going to be a magical treatment and that has become obsolete and there is even recommendation that one should not use this uh, uh, convalescent plasma so these were the four pillars which we have to subscribe to and we'll see what went out and possibly what will remain and with regards to the interventions in icu oxygen is an elixir for covid we don't want patients coming to icu needing oxygen because we want to halt but what has interestingly evolved is the prone position proning even when they are on minimal oxygen awake proning even when they are on devices like hfno or niv really has been a game changer because even there was a very good randomized control trial that came on awake proning which really showed huge merit in having significant outcome benefit if you prone this patient so i think the, the one take home which is very simple and which is uh, which has absolutely no cost to it is this proning i think we should really be relentless and aggressive and regimental in this proning which can really make a difference and proning occurs uh, is beneficial across the spectrum from oxygen to other uh, high flow oxygen devices even to intubated mechanical ventilated then we had a whole concept of early versus late intubation all that is debunked now now we intubate whoever deserves to there are uh, different criteria then there was a concept of l and h even that is debunked then there are anecdotal reports of h pot having a role and ecmo in a very uh, advanced cases as a salvage measure then there was the whole thing about anti fibrotics perfenidone nitrinib so there's no real strong evidence lung transplant as a desperate measure in fact on h pot we did publish this paper as a review article whether it's there are a lot of anecdotal reports but it's a interesting concept that one could think of so now we thought remdesivir is sort of uh, shelved and then this article came in 2021 21st december just two days back so this is a very interesting study which took basically opd management of patients uh, who were uh, had symptom onset within 7 days but they took patients with risk factors uh, for this study uh, who would possibly have a disease progression they took patients more than 60 years who were obese or who had one of the comorbidities so these are typically the patients who would progress to severe disease and they gave remdesivir for only 3 days 200 mg which is a standard the primary end point they looked at was medically attended visits which means patients who needed to go to hospital for worsening of symptoms or 28 day death 61.6 were diabetic 55 were obese and 47 was hypertensive mean age was 50 and this was the result uh, so 562 randomized between remdesivir and placebo and if you see they had a mortality benefit 
uh, in remdesivir uh, group as compared to placebo significant statistically and even their visits to hospital was significantly less in remdesivir as compared to placebo and adverse events there was no difference so when i looked at this study in fact in our expert committee in our state we used to argue that remdesivir should be reserved for patients who are only on oxygen or who come to hospital because even the effect size in the previous study showed its maximum benefit in oxygen patients needing oxygen but this study completely reverses that stand and says even in opd uh, sort of a patients you give it for 3 days possibly we can prevent progression of these patients to uh, worsening condition so this is something which is again uh, sort of re reinvigorated our enthusiasm so the conclusions the authors made was remdesivir for 3 days 87% reduction in the risk of hospitalization and death so so that is the current understanding of it so how much we believe in, we need to see whether it translates to clinical outcomes then this new molecule came molnupiravir so we are here today to just talk a bit briefly on this molnupiravir because this is another newer pirivir uh, like so all these uh, piravirs which are including remdesivir they basically act through rna dependent rna polymerase and induce anomalies into the rna of the virus so these are potent ribonuclide analog which inhibits uh, viral replication and the, the uniqueness of molnupiravir is it has n hydroxy cytidine and molnupiravir once it's ingested it's cleaved into an active component called eidd in 1931 and in the presence of kinase it uh, produces this uh, n hydroxy cytidine triphosphate basically the rna dependent rna polymerase which uh, looks like this you use a ctp which is cytidine triphosphate or uridine triphosphate or uh, uh, to uh, to produce this but here it uses instead of ctp and utp it uses mtp incorporates guanine and adenosine and for listeners if you don't remember all that the only thing we need to know is it induces mutation in the virus it induces anomaly and that is called viral error catastrophe it basically produces a mutation in the viral uh, rna sequencing so that further replication does not happen basically that is the essence and it does it through mtp which is n-hydroxy cytidine that's all we need to understand and this was a very very good study very comprehensive study which is a phase 1 randomized controlled trial that came from uk uh, uk authors and the uh, us uh, which is a very good study so which means to say this molecule has been studied fairly extensively this was a randomized controlled trial to look at the safety whether this is safe so done in 19 to 60 so they used three doses 1600 mg 800 mg and 200 mg 200 mg was to ascertain whether this molecule works better in the fed state or in the fasting state and they gave this for 5.5 5 days and follow up was done for 14 days and what they found was 1600 mg or 800 mg twice a day seems to be the appropriate dose because the peak concentrations were attained much better and the median time to concentration was 0.25 about one hour and 0.2 percent of the active ingredient was present which in the serum and how they came to the dose that 800 mg twice daily was better was more than 800 mg was needed to attain good urinary i mean to attain uh, detectable levels in the urine so which means below that they did not uh, they were not able to ascertain the active in ingredient in the urine and half life was 1 hour elimination was 7.1 hour and less than 400 mg the active uh, component of this molecule was not calculable which means possibly it is less effective less than uh, 1600 mg per day so that's how possibly they could and it was found that fed state had a uh, better sort of in fed state had a uh, less less sort of an active ingredient which means on empty stomach the absorption was better but authors do subscribe later on that it did not make any clinical difference so that was the phase one which basically said uh, looked into the pharmacokinetics and the safety this is a phase two trial which looked into sort of a viral clearance and uh, here they use they looked at day three viral levels and they found with molnupiravir 800 mg there was 1.9 percent as opposed to 16.5 percent of the viral which means there was reduction in the virus significantly with molnupiravir and at day five there was no virus identified at 800 mg dose and this is a graphical representation so this is a placebo group this is a 200 mg 400 mg so basically again this phase two reconfirms that at 800 mg it had a maximum efficacy in uh, reducing or increasing the viral clearance as compared to the other dosages and by day five if you see there is no virus detectable uh, with that dosage so that's about the uh, phase two trial which looked into the viral clearance then there was this move out study which came so this was the interim report which they threw out and this study was published recently in NEJM 
so they had this patients randomized. This was an interim report, uh, 385 in Molnupiravir and 377. And if you see the patients needing hospitalization and death was significantly less in Molnupiravir as compared to placebo, adverse events, there was no difference. And there were three animal studies done by Canadian group and US group done in mice, ferrets, uh, and hamsters, and they all found good viral clearance. So this was the more randomized controlled trial recently published in NEJM. So this was the interim report I looked in. 1,433 patients, 709 in Molnupiravir group, 699 in the placebo group. And again, you see the hospital admission and death was 6.8 as compared to 9.72 in placebo and absolute risk reduction was 3%. And deaths, there were less deaths in Molnupiravir group. There was no serious adverse events and the predominant side effect was headache 12.5% and diarrhea was 7.1%. So this is the current sort of evidence. Uh, but I think the phase one trial was a very, very comprehensive trial. I, uh, so this, this, this particular mode study also came in NEJM. So which possibly we need to see whether this really prevents the progression of this disease into patients needing hospitalization. If it does that, I think we really have a sort of a conviction. We could possibly gain conviction that this, uh, this would lessen the burden on our healthcare. So very briefly, I'll touch on uh, antibody cocktail because this also made a lot of inroads, especially in preventing. We are only talking about molecules which really prevent patients progressing into healthcare. So this was a study, again, which came in NEJM looking at uh, casirivimab and imdimab. These are basically antibodies which bind to your spike protein because spike protein is what the virus uses to enter into the cells. So these antibodies bind to the spike protein and prevent the binding of these virus to the, uh, to the entry into the cells. And these antibodies are basically... Uh, act on receptor binding domain. So there are three receptor binding domain on which it acts and it blocks the entry of this virus into the cells. And it is also claimed that this is effective against mutant strains. But now the question will arise now with the Omicron, which has antibody evading ability, whether these antibodies or these cocktails would hold the test of time, we do not know. We need more data. So these are the three different receptor binding domains on which it acts. So very quickly, I'll take you through this study. So this study, they compared two doses, 2.4 grams and 8 grams of Regeneron. And they looked at endogenous immune response to the virus. And they looked at the change in the viral load from day one to day seven and percentage of patients needing hospital admission, inclusion criteria. So one interesting thing about this study is, I'll just show you this slide. They did an antibody level for all the patients. They looked at IgA levels, IgG levels, and the nucleocapsid antibody level. And this was the group. So what, see this slide, what it shows basically is what they found is in patients who are antibody negative uh, when they recruited, they found the viral copies were very high. But in patients who started developing antibodies, they found the viral copies were very low, which means to say this particular cocktail worked well in patients who were antibody negative or who, in patients who were not able to produce antibodies as opposed to patients who could produce antibodies. And that is the beauty of this, uh, at least the trial. You know, if you read it, it's a very interesting trial. So they looked at the viral load. It, it, it was successful in reducing the viral load significantly, hospitalization 3% compared to 6%. And, and and between the two doses, the high dose and low dose, there was no major difference in the viral load. That's why if you recall the, the, the antibody cocktail, which is available, we split it into two and give it to two patients because even the lower dose is good enough with attaining good effect as compared to the higher dose. And this is a pictorial representation as, see, this is a very interesting in the antibody negative, which means in patients where they're not able to mount an antibody, where viral copies is more, the antibody cocktail had a better effect as compared to the patients where antibodies were positive and the viral copies were lower. So that is the strength of this study. And if you see at more than 10 to the power of four copies, the effect was less as opposed to the group where uh, patient had higher viral copies. So someone who has a higher viral copies, the effect of this antibody cocktail was much better. So the conclusions they made was this antibody cocktail Regeneron QV was useful in reducing the viral load, especially in patients who do not have endogenous immune response. It clears the virus or in patients who have a high viral overload in that it is effective. And that is where the merit of this study was there. And the safety was very good in this study. So in the next two minutes, uh, I'll just cover this aviptadil, which is exciting for intensivists like me. Uh, I think Etin sir and me have deliberated on this in the previous meeting. So this is a very interesting molecule, which possibly holds promise because there are three big trials happening on aviptadil. The interim report of one trial has come. So this is a vasoactive intestinal polypeptide which acts on the alveolar type 2 cells. And the alveolar type 2 cells constitute only 5% of the lung cells. 
and it acts on the VPAC1 receptors and the ACE2 uh, ACE receptors which uh, COVID uses. And by acting on this, it improves the, uh, improves the oxygenation, especially in patients with ARDS, increases the surfactant production, and it maintains the integrity of the alveolar type 1 cells and prevents exudation, which typically happens in uh, ARDS. And it prevents NMDA caspase 3 activation and protects from pulmonary edema or non cardiogenic pulmonary edema the ARDS have and inhibits the production of local interleukin-6, tumor necrosis, and surfactant production. So in that way, so this particular molecule is of interest to intense ways like me because when someone comes with ARDS, we want some molecule which can possibly reverse, and it is shown to restore the barrier function. And this amipedal is a, not a very new molecule. It has been tested in sarcoidosis, pulmonary fibrosis, and there are case series where it has shown to be of benefit. And the dosage is 50 to 150 picomoles per kg for 12 hours. So these are the three trials I want to the, uh, you know, this, which is exciting for me. The COVID AIV trial, the interim data is out. There is a SAMI-care trial that is happening uh, and there is an inhalational also they are using which is called AV COVID-2. So these are the three trials. So for an intensivist like me, I would be interested to see the result of this, whether we could uh, sort of uh, have a merit of using this in our ARDS patients. So the, I'll just show you the, uh, the interim report that has come of COVID AIV. This was done in 10 hospitals. So the primary endpoint was to look at recovery in respiratory failure, discharge from hospital survival at day 28. And secondary endpoints was to look at duration of mechanical ventilation and extubation. And here, interestingly, they've taken patients who are on HFNO, which means who are already sick, and 127 patients randomized between aviptadil and placebo. And we saw day 28 recovery of 71% in aviptadil as compared to 48% in placebo. And that effect lasted even up to day 60 recovery was more in aviptadil Avipadil as compared to placebo. So this sort of raises our excitement for intensivists like us to see if possibly this drug may save lives when they come sick to our ICU. So the take-home message, what remains after the second wave, all the other antivirals are out. Remdesivir, although it is not uh, suggested in WHO, but this new trial has again raised our hope. So we need to see how Molnupiravir will uh, stand the test of time. Nirmatrelvir or Pax uh, Lovid uh, is a protease inhibitor. It's like a HIV drug. And uh, Pax, uh, Pax Lovid has nirmatrelvir with a little bit of ritonavir. And uh, the interim study is already, uh, they put out a data saying it reduces uh, hospitalization by 89%. So we don't know when this would come to India. Anti-inflammatory, uh, no debate. Steroid 6-MG DEXA or equivalent of a 32-MG methylprednisolone, prednisolone equivalent dose is good enough. You don't need to resort to high dose. Tocilizumab is here to stay, so we, uh, we could use it in patients who have worsening respiratory failure, and JAK inhibitors are possibly here to stay, bacitinib and tocilizumab. And anticoagulation, low molecular weight heparin, we have to continue to use in a prophylactic, therapeutic, only in a select group of patients where there's already evidence of thrombi formation or venous thromboembolism, maybe in that we could reserve it. Antibody cocktails, keserimumab, imdimumab, at least the, if you have to subscribe to the evidence, it seems to hold merit. But we don't know whether in Omicron it will have any promise. Bumblanivimab, ATCVimab is still not out there. So this was the recent thing. So thank you very much. I would end with this beautiful quote and I'll hand over to Dr. Nitin, sir. Thanks a lot, to Dr. Rangappa. Excellent presentation and overview of what we have been doing for the last two years and how things have changed in the therapy. I think that brings me to the third speaker. I've already introduced him, uh, Dr. Randeep Guleria. And he is going to tell us what have we learned and where we are going. Is Dr. Guleria there? Yes, I'm there. I'm just trying to load my slides. I'm uh, not able to get that. Just give me a minute. I'm not able to share my uh, slides with, with the uh, organizers. Just allow me to have that. I'm sure. Um, so. <clears throat> 
Okay, now I've got it. Thank you. Are my slides visible now? Yes, yes, yeah. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'll just quickly cover what I, uh, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been covered. So I'll try and be as brief as possible. Uh, I'll cover the current status, the issue of the impending third wave and the variants, which have already been covered and the lessons learned. Now, if you look at the current status, it is COVID-19 is the biggest pandemic of our lifetime. We are, uh, we've already seen that 275 million people worldwide have been infected by this virus. And we've already had more than 5.37 million deaths. And India itself has had two devastating waves and we are now seeing the beginning of the third wave. If you look at the numbers, India has the second highest number of documented cases at 3.47 crores. And we have the third highest number of documented deaths. But if you look at it in, num in terms of cases per million and deaths per million, we are in a much better situation. We started off in Jan 30th of January 2020, where we had the first reported cases of India. We then had the national lockdown in March of 2020, the first wave in September 2020. The vaccine got rolled out on the 16th of January 2021. It's going to be one year. And uh, we had the second wave in March to May. And Omicron actually was reported in India on the 2nd of December. Uh, we've had two waves, but we're seeing the rise of another wave, the third wave, which would come early next year as far as uh, various predictions are concerned. So after two years of pandemic, new waves are still striking around the uh, world. And this is something that you are seeing that there is a huge number of cases. Uh, US is currently reporting more than one lakh cases a day. And we're seeing the same thing as far as UK is concerned. And therefore, if you look at the current chart, despite 8 billion vaccination doses worldwide, COVID cases continue to rise with multiple peaks. And this is basically due to multiple factors. I think one is, of course, varying immunity, which is uh, happening because of uh, uh, people having had the vaccine or having had infection quite some time back. There's also the issues of new viral variants, uh, which are emerging. Uh, we had Delta, before that we had Alpha, and now we have Omicron. All of them have escape immunity uh, mechanisms, and therefore this is causing, uh, again, repeated waves. And the new viral variants, even Delta was very, very um, uh, transmissible, but the uh, newer variant Omicron is even more transmissible than what we saw as far as Delta is concerned. And we're seeing a relaxation of lockdown. There is a uh, fatigue among uh, citizens, and there is a relaxation of COVID-appropriate behavior. And all of this oh. is subsequent waves. Uh, this is a paper which was published by uh, ICMR where they looked at what could be the cost, uh, the mechanism as far as a new wave is concerned. This is, was based on a mathematical modeling. And they had really at that time calculated that immune mediated mechanisms are unlikely to drive a severe third wave on its own. And the mechanism of a third wave could be a new variant that is more transmissible and at the same time capable of escaping prior immunity, which is what we are seeing as far as Omicron is concerned. And of course, a relax of COVID appropriate behavior and lockdowns, which are highly effective, basically being uh, uh, So their uh, prediction, this was, I think the paper published somewhere in September or October, was that these two factors will lead to a new wave. And this has actually been what we're seeing that the variants of concern have been a major cause because they have uh, either increased transmiss uh, transmissibility, they have the ability to evade immunity, to pre, uh, of the pre variants and they increase disease severity. Uh, we've already had the alpha variant, which uh, caused significant uh, issues. And the second wave actually started initially with the alpha variant, which was uh, more transmissible, started of course in UK as what was at that time known as the Kent variant. And then subsequently, of course, the beta variant was limited predominantly to South Africa. And one of the predictions right now is that the decrease in Omicron is because they've had one wave of beta uh, variant infection in South Africa, and that is why they're seeing a milder infection, and more data needs to come out from Europe and from the UK before we can say that this is actually a milder infection. Uh, India, of course, had this huge second wave, which was because of the Delta variant, uh, which was more transmissible, caused more severe disease and hospitalization, and lowered the effect of the uh, vaccine. I won't touch upon Omicron because this has already been covered very well by Dr. Swaminathan. But uh, what I would really like to say that the lessons that we've learned is how can we prevent the third wave? And I think what we need to push on is what we have right now. One is more and more COVID appropriate behavior, masking, physical distancing and hand hygiene still are very, very important. 
limited lockdown so that the chain of transmission can be broken. We need to really have enhanced genomic surveillance because unless you know what is happening and what are the variants which are emerging, you will not be able to move forward. And there has to be an upgradation of the vaccine drive because that is the only other uh, weapon that we have. COVID appropriate behavior needs to continue. There are large body of data. This is a systemic review which was published in 2020 in the Lancet, which looked at 172 observational studies from 16 countries. And what it clearly showed was that physical distancing uh, was really very useful. Transmission of viruses was lower with physical distancing of one meter or more compared with the distance of less than one meter. And this looked at uh, data from MERS, SARS, and from COVID-19. It also showed that face masks were very effective. A properly fitted face mask could result in a large reduction in the risk of infection. And this is something that we need to push very hard. It also showed a greater reduction in N95 or similar respirators as compared to a disposable surgical mask. And eye protection also was associated with less uh, infection. So these are things that we need to keep in mind, especially as far as healthcare workers are concerned who have the chance of getting exposed to this new variant, which, which predominantly is asymptomatic or causes very, very mild symptoms. Second is that limited lockdowns or curbs at hotspots hot spots of infection with gradual reopening will be very useful. A lot of states have now started this uh, uh, ro rolling this out in terms of night curfews and other activities. And this has been actually shown even in the 1918 pandemic that uh, lockdowns were the cornerstone of the epidemic response in areas which had stricter policies or cities in the US which had stricter policies uh, did better in terms of mortality and they were able to come back to employment and uh, other activities faster as compared to those that had a more lenient policy. So even in 1918, the flu pandemic uh, clearly showed that mortality and coming back uh, the, or the economy recovering was linked to having a stricter policy to begin with to break the chain of transmission. And this is something that we need to push for even nowadays. The other third thing is we need to have enhanced genomic surveillance. Uh, India has started the INSAGOG. The INSAGOG was started in January of this year, the 18th of January of this year. One had been pushing for it for, the, for quite some time. It started off with a handful of labs, about 10 labs, 10 national labs. It's now gone up to more than 30 labs. And now even a lot of private labs have come into this uh, network of Insagog. And there is this whole issue of data sharing, which will really help in us getting an idea of new emerging variants and how the different variants are behaving in different parts of the country. Insagog actually discovered the B1617 lineage, and it was reported at that time as a double mutant. And from this lineage, we had the B. 16172, uh, which is the Delta variant, which was declared a variant of concern on the 11th of May 2021 by WHO and cause is, has caused a huge surge, not only in India, but Delta was uh, causing a huge increase in number of cases in Europe, UK and US before Omicron uh, entered the picture. Vaccines should be upgraded uh, uh, to a quick and sustainable pace. I think this is very important. Major challenges remain the emergence of new variants with immune escape mechanism, uh, equitable global distribution and vaccine hesitancy. There is now data, this is an older data from uh, the uh, uh, Public Health England, which showed that both the mRNA vaccine and the AstraZeneca, which is uh, a viral vector vaccine, were effective as far as severe disease and mortality was concerned against the Delta variant. We've already seen some data as far as the, uh, as far as Omicron is also concerned. This is a paper from our center where we looked at uh, uh, the eff effective, uh, efficacy of co-vaccine, and this was done during the second wave, when, which was predominantly uh, led, uh, driven by the Delta strain. And what we found was that the adjusted effectiveness of uh, co-vaccine against symptomatic COVID-19 after two dose administration, at least 14 days uh, uh, later, was around 50%. And this was something that uh, really showed that vaccination was still working, although the efficacy had come down significantly. So what we really are seeing right now is that all the new variants are a major cause of concern. The vaccines are still holding out. And even against Omicron, it does seem to suggest that vaccines which are developed against the older strain, the vaccines were developed against the Wuhan strain, are still holding out as far as severe disease and death is concerned against the new variants. And there is now a lot of research going on to see whether we can develop uh, a sort of a universal uh, vaccine as far as COVID, uh, the coronavirus is concerned which could actually be able to cover for new emerging variants also. But having said that,
Vaccines can also be tweaked to cover the new variants. We do that every year as far as the influenza vaccine is concerned. And this is something which is also being looked at of uh, coming out with new uh, vaccines, which could cover not only one variant, but be bivalent or trivalent in terms of covering more than one variant. And uh, so vaccines can be tweaked. We do this every year for the influenza vaccine and a new influenza vaccine is given every year. We have a quadrivalent influenza vaccine right now. And the mRNA vaccines are easier to tweak and change uh, as compared to the traditional vaccines. And therefore, it should be possible to come out with new generation vaccines as we move along uh, with this pandemic. The virus is going to stay here for a long time. It's going to become endemic. So vaccinations are also going to be something that we'll need for quite some time. India's vaccination program, program is something that we're all proud of. It's done remarkably well. Uh, as uh, we have now more than 60% uh, of our population has received at least one dose of COVID vaccine and almost 40% of the population has received two doses. And therefore, this is, there is confidence that along with uh, the vaccination, the immunity that we got because of the infection per se, uh, which is known as hybrid immunity, would be able to really decrease uh, the severity of disease, which we may see with subsequent uh, new variants, which may come along, including Omicron variant. It's already been said that developing a vaccine is only half the work done. Delivering it equitably is the most important step. This is something that needs to be done because this is what we're seeing, that in parts of the world where vaccination uptake is low, we continue to have viral replication, which leads to the emergence of new mutants, and they, they develop more and more immune escape mechanism. This data clearly showed that if vaccine distribution was done only to high-income countries, only 33% of deaths could be averted. However, if it was done equitably, to all countries proportion to the population, almost 61% of deaths could be uh, averted. We already know that uh, the data for multiple boosters is not that strong, yet most of the Western world is actually racing towards giving booster doses, whereas in Africa, less than 10% of the entire population have received uh, any vaccine at all. So there is a huge uh, sort of inequity as far as vaccination is concerned. Vaccine hesitancy is also important. It's something that we see less in India, but seen a lot globally. There are people who insist that they will not get the vaccinated at all. And WHO had actually said that this is one of the top 10 global threats in 2019. And this needs to be addressed by all healthcare workers because public perception needs to be changed as far as vaccination is concerned. Like I said, in India, the data that has been published suggests that almost 75% uh, of people in India were willing to take the vaccine, uh, as far as COVID was concerned, the main reason for uh, not wanting to take it were uh, side effects and safety and lack of trust in the, in the process. And this was seen predominantly in young people and those in the lower socioeconomic status. We need to really push for uh, taking care of vaccine hesitancy by recommending the vaccine to all our patients who come to the OPD and are candidates for vaccination, identifying their concern, educating them, and trying to dispel all misconceptions which may be there. Uh, one of the other lessons that we've learned is that in the last 20 years, there have been a large number of outbreaks. 1998, we saw H5N1, which is known as bird flu. We had SARS after that. We've had outbreaks of uh, MERS coronavirus. We've had Ebola, Zika virus. And therefore, in the last 20 years, for, we are in the last uh, 21 years, we're seeing huge number of outbreaks and therefore pandemics are ine inevitable in this century. And this, this is because of multiple factors, travel, crowding, and a large number of viruses which are of zoonotic regions are actually jumping species and therefore there is a whole uh, issue of trying to look at one health in a holistic manner. Even 100 years after the flu pandemic, it's very important for us to push for uh, physical distancing and masking, especially in an indoor environment because for respiratory viral infection, this is very, very important. The other lessons that we've learned is that we have to really develop strategies for vaccine and drug development at pandemic speed during the pandemic. We were able to do that for vaccination. We need to push that aggressively for drugs. A lot of drugs that we're using are mainly repurposed drugs. And of course, there is a need to safeguard the care of other diseases during the time of pandemic. There has been a lot of suffering because of uh, the collateral damage that has occurred, whether it be TB program, vaccination, or other illnesses that have been there as part of uh, the suffering uh, of COVID-19. 
So uh, this has already been shown, the number of uh, new molecules which have come in besides vaccine, we have monoclonal antibodies, immunomodulators and antivirals. All of these have actually come over the last 18 months or so, and this is also a rapid development, and this needs to continue. Uh, in 2018, I had written an editorial where we had said that 100 years after the full pandemic, we are still vulnerable and we really need to be uh, preparing for future pandemics. I've already elucidated the reason why I, we said that, and uh, I think this is something we need to keep in mind for the future. So I'll just conclude by saying that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to rage worldwide with the emergence of new variants, and in India, we will see another wave. Uh, it's already started. COVID appropriate behavior, lockdown and genomic surveillance are necessary measures to fight against the pandemic. We need to really aggressively push for all of this and vaccines are the best weapon that we have currently to defeat the virus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Guleria. <coughs> Perfect ending of the session. <clears throat> so I think we've discussed the whole how it began and what is the therapy uh, how the therapy has changed and Dr. Guleria has given us overview of what is happening in the world and what is going to happen likely to the vaccine. So my question to all of you actually, um, whosoever is, that now where are we, if we have to take a booster, this is one of the questions also, which is correct. We do, at the moment, vaccines are efficacious, although less effective against Omicron, but still the evidence is that it, it is efficacious. Uh, so if you booster has to be given to say healthcare workers and immunocompromised uh, people with other comorbidities, what is the time frame when you should be looking at it in terms of the third booster dose? And how do you mix the vaccines? Well, Dr. Guleria, I think you can begin the thing. Okay, I'll start with that. Uh, do we need actually from my point of view, this is my personal thought that we need more data before we say uh, boosters are needed because currently what we're looking at is predominantly the antibodies that are present. We need to really look at the cell mediated immunity, T cell immunity and be able to say that we need uh, the boosters will be effective. We have patients who have had actually the booster and have had infection with Omicron. We have patients even in India who have actually taken three shots of the Pfizer and have been test have tested positive for Omicron. So before we say that boosters are effective, I think we need to have data which suggest who are who need it. And it's important to remember that we're talking of a booster dose and not of an additional dose that we are giving to people who are immunocompromised. An additional dose to people who are immunocompromised because they don't have a good antibody response is still justified. But to say that everyone needs a booster dose, uh, including the younger age group, I think we need more data for that. Secondly, coming to heterologous rather than uh, uh, vaccination, I think there, there is now data which is emerging which suggests that if you are able to do a mix and match, it, will, it leads to a better immune response and therefore in the future, it would be uh, uh, heterologous vaccination schedule would be better. It is definitely something one needs to look at as far as the viral vector vaccine is concerned because it may have uh, it, the efficacy of the vac a viral vector vaccine may come uh, down because of the vector that you're using to, against which antibodies may be formed. So I think we need more data as far as uh, deciding on booster is concerned. Uh, we will need a booster at some point in time, but two important thing is what, who should get it first, when should it be given, and what should be the ideal uh, vaccine to be given as a booster, the older vaccine against the Wuhan strain, or do we need a new a vaccine as we do for influenza every year. Um, any uh, difference of opinion, Dr. Swaminathan? Obviously, I'm going to have a very different opinion. Let me put it like this. Why would I think healthcare workers should get the vaccine? If you look at what's happening in London today, the number of absenteeism of healthcare workers is more than doubled. And in a period of four days. Now, this is concerning. We are sitting on the cusp of another wave and a numbers where the numbers seem to be really scary. We need a situation where we can reduce the risk of absenteeism in healthcare workers because of illness. And if we don't do that, I'm worried that we may not have enough manpower to handle this if it turns out to be a nightmare. And for that reason, at least, forget the severity. To increase manpower productivity, healthcare workers getting the vaccine, to me, makes sense. Number one. <clears throat> Number two, as far as reduction of uh, mortality is concerned. I think the data from Israel is fairly convincing 
that yes, there is reduction in mortality. Do we have in vitro data, in vivo data to show that? Well, let's look at the data from Scotland and Brazil, which was published a few days ago with the two doses of the Covishield. In about four to six, five months time itself, the efficacy of the two doses of the vaccine in preventing severe disease, I'm not talking about infection, in preventing severe disease drops off pretty significantly. Granted, they excluded people who had uh, pre-infection, that is hybrid immunity. That's the curveball for us. Is hybrid immunity going to come to our uh, rescue? I'm really praying it does, and I'm very optimistic it will be. But prayer is one thing, but sitting on a huge tranche of vaccines which are unused, we want to give it to South to Africa, but we cannot give it to Africa. We want our uh, people who, who haven't taken the first two doses to take it, but they won't take it. We don't want to give it to our healthcare workers and those vulnerable. At the end, I'm worried we're going to end up on sitting on a huge dose of vaccines and face another wave, which to me is the most worrying thing. No, also at this moment, we vaccine equity is all right. I mean, it is nice to be big hearted, but I think we owe it more to our own population first than to the, to the rest of the world. Because if you look at the West, what they've done, they've hogged most of the vaccines, leaving hardly anything for Asia and Africa. We sustained because we had a good manufacturing facilities of vaccines and we could have a good distribution to do that. The government has done a, done a good job, but I think high time, we, in my opinion, I think boosters uh, should be thought of. And evidence, if you look at it, I see how many, how quickly the papers are published in NGM and Lancet, if you look at it. We did the paper on TOSI, randomized study. Within six weeks, it was peer-reviewed, and within eight weeks, it was published in Lancet. So I think they are also doing their thing because of the pandemic faster. And I think we need to bend the rules a little bit. Uh, Pradeep, any, any comments? Yeah, I, quick, I, quick one? yeah I, I think this debate has been going on, sir, and I concur to some extent with uh, uh, Subra. Uh, and especially we believe in evidence. The Israeli study showed significant 90%. Uh, that is one aspect. The second aspect is the reinfection rates, which Subra very nicely elucidated is uh, known to occur more lethally with uh, this Omicron. So at least, and we know from the data that reinfections with COVID happens within a year, I think so. Uh, so given that fact, in the countries like Israel believe that the third dose, uh, having booster is complete vaccination. At least for healthcare workers uh, who are commonly exposed to more virulent strains and who are in ICU or any other healthcare workers are the first people who should possibly get the booster. Uh, given whatever data, and we, we have to sub substantiate with our science, we have evidence to say. And there is one report or one uh, data from us also, which shows the booster response was reasonably good in the population they gave booster dose. So all in all, for healthcare workers, yes. And for vulnerable population, possibly yes, uh, Yatin, sir. Uh, but uh, vaccine equity is the is the priority, and this has to be considered. Yes, the time frame, six months, I would think, if you're giving it. Yeah, uh, so I mean, most studies have said, yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. So, two or three things. One is there is no doubt that if you're looking at uh, uh, booster dose, there are two or three groups that we need to, uh, or vaccination or booster dose, there are three groups yes. that we need to focus on, which is what one is trying to push for also. One is healthcare workers. And I totally agree with that, that even if you have mild disease, if you have a large number of healthcare workers who are in isolation or quarantine, it is going to cause a huge strain on your healthcare system. So, and the other issue is that most healthcare workers got vaccination before the second wave. We were the first lot to get it in January and February. So hybrid immunity may not be there in healthcare workers, which is something that we need to keep in mind. And that is why that is one category if we have to give a booster would be required. Second is the elderly. We still need more data before we can say that Omicron does not cause severe disease in the elderly. The African population is younger, even the in, even in all waves, it's the el younger age group which starts off the wave it, and subsequently it follows and that's why hospitalization deaths tend to follow later on. So that is the other group that we should look at. The third group that we are pushing for, and I think that's another area, is the younger age group because they are the ones who will transmit the virus more. So, you know, the teenagers, they should also be considered in the vaccination program right now. If we are able to get that, then maybe we will be able to have some protection as far as uh, the uh, new wave is concerned. So I totally agree with that. The only issue is that I would say that we would, before we say that, uh, you know, everyone needs to have a booster dose, because that means we need to give it to even the younger age group. Why should we not give a booster to a 30-year-old person? 
we need to have more data and we need to prioritize it because if you open it up then we don't have that many doses readily we don't have another let's say uh, doses for all adults over the age of 18 for a booster dose so we will have to stagger it in a manner and prioritize it and and have more data which will suggest that it is effective we need even data from our own we have no data as far as covaxin is concerned what is the efficacy of covaxin against omicron we need to have neutralizing studies to be able to show how effective is uh, this vaccine against uh, the new strain before we say that we need to have additional dose whether we call it a additional dose or whether we call it a booster dose will depend on that so i think we are actually looking for that we should have a booster because it will protect us but i think we also need to have more data before we can really say that there is a lot of science behind it okay so i couldn't agree with with you more because even when we started vaccine we had to prioritize whom to give the vaccine first and then we came to the overall population i think we should now switch from the from the vaccine discussion so to to the other medications which was one of the questions uh, vivek sharma has asked is that uh, 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 can we give remdesivir for three days once a day in some patients i think that uh, pradeep has answered pradeep will you quickly answer that yeah i mean uh, see this study i think sir uh, is by gilead study so one would have little apprehensions yeah. uh, you know this is a industry sponsored study which is ob- obviously come in nature but well conducted study so if you have to purely subscribe to the science uh, i mean see in the first and second wave we really rationed this remdesivir and in fact if you look at the previous studies i think sir the effect size was bigger in patients who are receiving oxygen now suddenly you are turning the table and saying you give it yeah, to stable patients patient. yeah so so that's a little worrying uh, but uh, but if you have to subscribe to the science maybe in a very high risk population um maybe one could consider is what i would think but i would still wait and uh, wait for more evidence to evolve and i would uh, you know like to hear comments from subra and uh, dr guleria sir on this uh, because of the face of the study study looks good but uh, we we cannot uh, take such a stand uh, at this point of time i would think also it is not going to be logistically that easy in india yeah out patient yeah. who comes to the hospital <clears throat> to give a shot or the nurse goes to his house to give three yeah. injections on three consecutive days intravenous infusions it's not going to be easy to organize that sort of a yeah. thing i think that's what brings me to the to the third drug which we talked about molnupiravir now let's not talk about oh, yes yes subra yeah. i need to make a couple of observations quickly if mm-hmm. i have your last one see yeah. this study worries me because it was stopped prematurely without any really good reason they have given some answers but i'm not very happy about it they didn't did not come to the interim analysis to stop the study it was just stopped the second thing is it was only for people who are unvaccinated it is not for vaccinated people number 3 this is concerning there was no difference in the viral loads even after 7 days of uh, of realization of the medicine remember for every antiviral that we have looked at the viral load comes down so this tells me this drug did not do what it's supposed to do which is basically bring down the virus if it is not bringing down the virus i am not 100% convinced about the effect of it so i am still not very sold on this because i still think it needs more data at this point and in addition to the point that you know we don't have enough for data to make it a publicly easily available option i think there are still some unknowns here yeah I agreed with that and to be honest i mean it's a closed meeting here we have but gilead's reputation has not been uh, excellent in this field uh, in the past so okay now that also brings me for for outpatients uh, this thing or mild to moderate uh, 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 patients who do not require hospitalization is molnupiravir is a good option because oral therapy no no why, no. why not yeah, i uh, i don't know how many of you have seen the new uh, submission that mrk has had on their website where they said in the second study no. it did nothing it did nothing overall comes to 30% so it's come down from 50% to 30% and the second study the benefit was zero uh, if i remember right i just have to correct uh, check that again whether it was actually zero uh, uh, dr guleria if you want to say something yeah so same thing you see the interim analysis which, which they had shown initially showed a better response up to 50% or more but subsequently when they looked at the data when the full study was completed it came down further and now they're saying that the efficacy is even less so i think again the drug is not going to be like a wonder pill or is going to be a game changer uh, and uh, therefore uh, i also have a little bit of reservation as far as it's it is uh, the drug is concerned the advantage of course is that it's a 
uh, oral tablet oral can be taken and unlike remdesivir even if you see giving it for 3 days either the patient has to come to the hospital and he's a positive patient he's infectious or someone has to go and give it to him so it's going to be the logistics are going to be very difficult and the remdesivir study is sponsored by gilead it is uh, the viral load did not come to, uh, show a significant change therefore i i don't think there is we need more data as far as uh, giving remdesivir early on uh, on an outpatient basis is concerned uh, we need more data for the other drug also i agree and, and, and again, also the, the population is also mm-hmm. the population is completely changed from the previous study you know hospitalized mm-hmm. patients requiring oxygen and now you are talking about uh-huh. outpatients uh, with a completely different uh, population see yeah okay so so i've nothing what are you saying yeah no no sorry i think you're right in that uh, it's same way with remdesivir molnupiravir also started out with the move out arm and to went to the move in study but uh, again so the point is that uh, molnupiravir one of the things that they said was is probably because in the second half it was more delta as compared to the original wuhan and probably it was less effective against delta that makes me more worried so you're telling me that strain by strain it can change its efficacy and now they have actually done a computation and said it should retain efficacy against, against omicron doesn't fill me with a lot of uh, warmth and hope i think uh, within sir another concern with these uh, piravirs is their ability to induce mutations i think that has been uh, mentioned in the discussion so that is something one should worry also because of the anomalies they keep creating in this viral rna sequencing mutagenic yeah yeah so that mutations can be a worrying trend also for us um, but but having said all that uh, remdesivir uh, you know the solidarity trial because you re- we read the whole paper they had lot of other gains in the you know secondary endpoints that they looked into so it is not com- it cannot completely be said that remdesivir that's why in our state committee we debated on this heavily but remdesivir still seems to have some promise you know because even solidarity trial there were a lot of endpoints which it showed when it was the respiratory failure also did not happen so there were a lot of other things although overall it did not show benefit so so remdesivir has to be kept as a reserve drug that is something which we should uh, we cannot completely uh, dissolve uh, but molnupiravir uh, we need more data but the phase 1 trial is a very good paper that came uh, you know that that is a very comprehensive very extensively studied drug but theoretical data we need more data so that would be my submission there is a question from dr Ash, uh, m k madnani uh, from prayagraj uh, what is the place of favipiravir in treatment i was using it when the, when uh, remdesivir was not available and that was the only antiviral drug available so uh, i was using it now favipiravir it has gone into decline so any comments from both of you all three of you sir favipiravir i have done extensive reading on this there's no robust data it is not as extensively studied as at least some of this remdesivir and uh, at least molnupiravir the phase 1 and phase the phase 1 is a very good study because it's a very comprehensive document and mm-hmm. they really looked at a lot of parameters but favipiravir it's very hard to get the details of all the extensive there were very small studies that were done so it did not really uh, excite us and even the clinical outcome studies were not very conclusive to give us a lot of confidence sir you know when the publication is happening in engineering journals it fills me with a lot of concern no, about true. it yeah. the first paper so, was engineering yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what would you do it in engineering journal anyway i don't know what maybe there are staff for papers but honestly uh, where i kept it was right next to the dustbin and it's moved in there now also not uh, not trying to be racist but when chinese paper are there i do take it with a bit of a pinch of salt i suppose yeah. fair enough fair enough <laughs> okay so we have another question about uh, uh one how are the sy- symptoms different in omicron i was listening to dr kodze today uh, kodzi yeah so according to her i mean the neuromuscular symptoms were more i mean patient we had more muscle pain and body aches and headaches in uh, omicron they did not have the classical respiratory symptoms and anosmia and um, all that sort of stuff any comments on any any of you again so i think uh, it te- tends to resemble a common cold more than uh, what it does for, as uh, uh, what uh, the original uh, covid was doing but lo- with lot of body aches and muscle aches with and headache which was reported as compared to uh, the previous uh, 
outbreaks. But otherwise, by and large, it's it is an upper respiratory viral infection. What I will also, say is this: yeah. given, mm-hmm. given that the household transmission is so intense, you are not going to have one person in the family falling ill with uh, uh, Omicron. It's going to be the whole family. And second thing is, uh, it's a pretest probability issue. Right now, numbers of Omicron are fairly low. In very short order, maybe seven to ten days, your numbers are going to really take off. After that, any fever, unless otherwise proved, you can assume it to be Omicron. Yeah, so at some point in time, we will have to move from, uh, let's say, a lab-based approach to a syndromic approach. And you will have to look at the syndrome and the if everyone in the family has got it, they have these uh, syndromic uh, symptoms, you assume it's Omicron. And I would say aggressively move towards isolation and other uh, factors rather than waiting for the test results to come. The, result to come the virus spreads, you will not have enough time for that. Yeah, just isolate as soon as you have any sort of symptoms suggestive. That's what one will have to do under the circumstances. Because there's more transmissibility, I think it is going to, it can cause a serious, uh, uh, serious uh, problem for, for this to come. And I think the standard therapy of, uh, say, low molecular weight heparin and steroids will remain, I suppose. That will be, I see no reason why that should not be effective therapy yeah. for these patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also, I think the monoclonal antibodies, I don't know how effective it will be. Theoretically, it will not be very effective. Any things to say on that? Theoretically, at least the in vitro data seems to be very, very concerning. But I think in vivo data will probably lag. Good news is the Western countries are ahead of us slightly, slightly in that curve. Maybe we can look at their data. But more and more hospitals in the US are now uh not deciding to offer the monoclonal antibodies that to me is a bit of a concern yeah was, uh, i mean it will not be effective against spike proteins whatever it acts against so i suppose where we were looking at it to reduce our hospitalizations we will have a problem and also with omicron also i think one study has shown that once the people are patients are hospitalized then the severity is uh, same as delta so if the numbers go up, although if, uh, say if transmissibility is unfortunately more, virulence may be low, but if the numbers go up to that extent, then we can get into trouble like what we did with Delta, despite uh, uh, t- I mean, uh, getting our systems together. Nandeep, any uh, projections on that? Yeah, so I think uh, there are two things. One is, of course, monoclonal antibodies usually are not working, except I think there is some data which suggests that uh, sotorimab may be effective as compared to others. So that uh, one paper, I, I remember re- seeing somewhere that that may be effective against Omicron. The issue, of course, is the numbers. Because if you look at the numbers that you're seeing in UK, and you look at it in terms of cases per million population, and you translate, translate that to cases per million population in India, then we are looking at almost 10 to 15 lakh cases per day. Now, if you say that if you are having 10 to 15 lakh cases per day, and even if you say that hospitalization is low, in absolute numbers, that is going to be large. And if that is large, then it is going to cause a strain on the healthcare system. And my fear is not, along with that, it should not create a panic reaction. Because, you know, when this happens, everyone feels that I should get admitted and block a bed, even if I don't need it. And that creates a huge uh, strain on the hospital that even people who have mild symptoms and may have some mild comorbidities want to get admitted just because they're worried that they may deteriorate in the next few days. So I think that is going to be a big challenge that we're going to have uh, probably end of next month. My one question to you, Dr. Guleria, as a public health uh, person, you being one of them, is that now the government, government, wants, <laughs> <laughs> the government wants separate ICUs and separate wards for Omicron. Does that make sense to you? Because if you already have a COVID ward, why do you have to have Omicron separate from that? So I don't think it's really required. This is more of a bureaucratic thing. And it's right. basically because of someone in a meeting suggested that if Omicron and uh, Delta were to meet together and you had a <laughs> reassortment of the virus, you would have a more dangerous uh, mutant which may come out and that led to this whole theory. But the way it's going around in the West, it is going to really just take over and become the dominant strain. And therefore, it is really not going to matter. So I don't think it really is matter. It, if you are positive, you're positive. And you ah, it doesn't make sense to say that. Yeah. Okay. 
So now I think at the end of the day, we have had an excellent discussion. Thank you very much. Um, uh, excellent presentations. We have covered most of the questions which were given by the, by the audience. We are likely to get into some serious uh, trouble in the next couple of months. The saving grace is that, that although transmissibility is more, but the virulence is less, it may cause less severe disease. And also, we are better prepared this time than what we were uh, the, the, the last time. And awareness is more, vaccination is more, and I think uh, we should be able to fight it better, better this time. And uh, uh, so let us hope that uh, things turn around and we all get a booster dose, at least the healthcare workers and elderly healthcare workers like me should be the first ones to, to get it. So with that, I'll close this uh, session. I'll hand it over to the uh, Mankind uh, team. Thank you, sir. Uh, so before we conclude this session, let me thank all those who have worked selflessly to make the scientific dialogue success. Our most sincere thanks to Professor Anil Guleria, Dr. Ethan Mehta, Dr. Subramanian Swaminathan, Dr. Pradeep Pandukha for taking time out of their very busy schedule and helping us to be future ready. We thank all our distinguished speakers of the evening. Most important, our audience who have spared their precious time. Your questions and queries have made this event livelier and interesting. Once again, I thank you all on behalf of myself and like mankind. Stay safe. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir.